Good afternoon, church. Evening. evening. Yeah, evening. Whatever. It's something. Um, I'll be reading from, I'll be reading in Romans 6, um, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11 from the NIV. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or do you know, or don't you know, that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him throughout baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like, like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since Christ since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Well, good evening. Back in September of... 2021, we began this series on Sunday evenings about the church of the Bible. <clears throat> and what is driving that is in this country, in the United States alone, there are over 200 Christian denominations that all claim to follow one book and one God. I find that very interesting. And so, What's driving this with me is, what did the Church of the Bible do? I mean, you have 200 denominations, can they all be right? Can they all be in line with what the Bible teaches about the Church of the Bible? And I'll even submit, does the Church of Christ do that? I would say that we try the very best that we can here at the Mesquite Church of Christ to follow the pattern of the Church of the Bible. But you know what? We're human. We're fallible. We make mistakes. We don't always get it right. But as I've said before, praise the Lord, we have the biblical pattern that we can come back to if we're willing to do so. In our study, we've looked at a number of things and about what the church is, what the church isn't. We've talked about um, the responsibility of Christians within the body of Christ, which is the church. Tonight, we're going to look at probably the most debated issue amongst believers. If it's not the most debated, I'd say it's right there at the top, very close. And that's the role that baptism plays within the life of the believer. Is it the point where someone is saved at that point? Or is baptism more or less an afterthought, an, an outward sign of an inward grace as I know that you've heard many times, uh, that salvation takes place before uh, baptism uh, through a reciting of the sinner's prayer and confessing Jesus as Lord and asking him into our heart to be our personal Lord and Savior. And so even with that being said, there is a divergence out there about, well, what exactly is baptism? Is it sprinkling? Is it pouring? Or is it immersion? Those are questions that I think anybody from the outside looking in would ask. Because you have churches out there that sprinkle infants, that pour water on the heads of infants. And you have churches that immerse in baptistries just like we have. And so what's the answer? What is the true answer? Is that something that we can just decide on our own and just go with it? Or do we have scriptural precedent that gives us the truth that we need? 
And so tonight we're going to get into this study about baptism, about what it is, but also about what it means. And so before we get into the message tonight, let's, let's go to God together in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us back tonight and for all the blessings that you shower upon us. We thank you for the blessing of the church, for the blessing of fellowship, for the blessing of our family and our church family. We thank you for all the things that you provide for us every day in the life that we live. Above all, we're thankful for Jesus and the perfect life that he lived and that perfect sacrifice that he became to save us from our sins. Spirit, I ask that this message will be your message. I ask that you will speak powerfully through this message and that you will delve deep into our hearts and help us to understand what baptism is and what it means and the role that it plays in the life of the believer by looking at what the church of the Bible did and help us as believers to if need be, move back to biblical center, to come back to the Bible. I pray that for every congregation of believers in this city. And we'll step back from our traditions, we'll step back from our doctrines, we'll step back from our preferences and say, okay, what does the Bible say? And what did the church of the Bible do? In all things especially on this very, very critical issue of baptism. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you in all things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Family, tonight as we continue in this study, and I hope that this has been an enjoyable study for you. I know that I've enjoyed it. Uh, As we continue in this study of the Church of the Bible we come to a study that specifically focuses on baptism. And you may be saying, if you've been here in person or if you've watched online, you may be saying, well, Devin, you talk about the subject of baptism to one degree or another in all of the previous 15 sessions that you've had. And that is true. That is absolutely true. Yes, I have. And the reason why is important. The reason why is because unlike the overwhelming majority of the Christian denominational world, family, I understand the Bible to teach that baptism is not an outward sign of an inward grace. I understand that the Bible clearly teaches that baptism is the very point at which we are saved and not an instant before. But with that being said, salvation isn't all about baptism. A lot of times I think people will look at us and say, well, you think it's all about baptism. No, it's not. It isn't all about baptism. There are some absolute essentials of faith that must precede baptism, or baptism is pointless. And these absolutes, fortunately, are things that the Christian denominational world is in agreement on. These absolutes are things that that we can and we do agree on, which gives us hope. Gives us great hope in finally achieving what Jesus prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane before going to the cross. You remember what he prayed for? He prayed, Father, may they all be one as we are one. You see, right now there's 200, at least 200 groups of believers out there that just don't see it all the same way. That's not what Jesus prayed for. And those absolutes, family, that we all agree on, are these, having a faith of things hoped for and not seen, as Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us. Having a faith that pleases God, according to Hebrews 11 verse 6. Having a faith that comes from the words of Christ, Romans chapter 10 verse 17. 
having a faith that believes Jesus to be the Son of God. John chapter 3, verse 16. Having a faith and belief that comes from a godly sorrow over the sacrifice of Jesus that brings repentance that is leading us to salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And a faith, belief, and repentance that causes us to confess Jesus as the Son of God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Family, up to that point, everything you see on the screen, up to that point, the denominational world and the church of the Bible are in lockstep. Everybody agrees on all of that. But then a divergence takes place. The denominational world seals the deal with the sinner's prayer. And inviting Jesus into our heart to be our personal Lord and Savior. That's what the denomination that I grew up in did. But here's the thing. There is no scripture to support that. The church of the Bible, on the other hand, seals the deal with baptism. Baptism into Christ, which according to Acts 2, provides two essential benefits for the believer. Number one, forgiveness of sins. Number two, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, after after Peter shares the gospel with the crowd, many of whom in the crowd were the ones that were saying, crucify him, crucify him when Jesus was on trial. Others were saying, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. These were the people that put Jesus on the cross, and Peter shares with them the gospel. And in verse 37 and 38, after they hear what they did, and it pricks them to the heart, It says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now take a good look at that. That is a scripture that we're all familiar with for the most part. Look at that crowd. That crowd now has the faith of Hebrews chapter 11. That crowd has heard the word. That crowd has believed the word. And that crowd is sorrowful for what their sins have done to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Family, they are now at that point of divergence that was on that slide just a moment ago. They're at that point of divergence. They're at that that crossroads of faith, if you will. They're at the point where everyone in the Christian world is in complete and total agreement. Family, these people are on the precipice of salvation. I mean, they're right on the edge. They're right there. And what does Peter tell them to do? Did he tell them to say a prayer? And invite Jesus into their heart to be their personal Lord and Savior? Did he do that? Because let me tell you, now would be the time. Now would be the time to do that. But he didn't do it. He didn't tell that crowd at Pentecost to do that. Paul did not tell Simon the sorcerer to do that in Acts chapter 8. Saul in Acts chapter 9, was not asked to do that. Or the Philippian jailer was not asked to do that in Acts chapter 16. In fact, family, there is no recorded conversion and experience that involves the sinner's prayer in the Bible. You can't find it. But yet, 99%, I would say, of the Christian world says that that's what you do. However, when you look at the Bible, 
And what the church of the Bible did, when you look at the Bible, every single conversion experience includes baptism. Every single one. Not baptism a few days later. Not baptism a week or even a few months later as an outward sign of an inward grace. You never see that in the scriptures. It's not there. Or to become a member of a denomination or a congregation. Baptism happened in every conversion experience, and it happened as soon as possible for the purpose of salvation. You know what primarily drove me to study this and to seek the truth of the church of the Bible years ago? It was that my denomination was, trying, was telling me that it was easier to get into heaven than it was that denomination. Yeah, man, if you hear, believe, repent, and confess Jesus as Lord, you're good to go for heaven. But if you're baptized, you can become a member of our denomination. So what you're telling me is that it's easier to get into heaven than it is your church. To an East Texan, that made no sense. So I sought the truth. I was driven to study And what I found is that the church of the Bible clearly teaches family that baptism is an essential part of the salvation process. It's where we seal the deal in the blood of Christ, in the eyes of God. But here's a question. And we may not be asking that question, but people from the outside looking in. There are more unchurched people in the United States now than ever before. There are people out there where it comes to to matters of faith and matters of biblical knowledge. It's a clean slate. It's like a brand new whiteboard with nothing on it. And they will ask this question, what is baptism? What is it? You see, there's a secondary divergence on that chart that we looked at earlier. And that divergence is this. Is baptism sprinkling? Is baptism pouring? Or is baptism immersion? Well, you know what? It depends on who you ask. You might not think that that's a good answer, but it's true. It depends on who you ask. And you may be asking, well, why does it depend on who you ask? Because the King James translators of the English Bible made it that way. And here's the reason why. When translating the Greek scriptures known as the Septuagint into English, the translators came across a Greek word. And that Greek word is baptizo. And baptizo means to plunge, to bury, to submerge, or to immerse. And so when the King James translators came upon that word in the Greek, they had a problem. They had a big problem. The problem was that the Anglican church, otherwise known as the Church of England, of which King James was the head of, practiced sprinkling of infants as baptism. In other words, their denominational doctrine was in direct contradiction to what the scriptures said. So rather than translate the word baptizo into the English immerse, bury, submerge, as they should have, they chose to transliterate the word baptizo, and it transliterated into baptize or baptism. Family, that saved them a lot of trouble. It saved them a lot of trouble, and it probably saved their lives. Because to translate that word correctly would have completely and totally wrecked their denominational doctrine of sprinkling or pouring water upon the heads of infants. So they didn't translate it. They transliterated it. They made it really easy. Because now you can ascribe 
whatever meaning you want to that word baptize. You can make it mean whatever you want to. You can make it purely subjective. So today, right now, as we speak, as I speak to you tonight, right now, some people, hey, baptism, that's pouring. Baptism, that's sprinkling. Baptism, that's immersion. We can ascribe whatever definition we want to it because the word was not translated. And so now, thanks to these translators, King James had his justification and saved his denominational practice of sprinkling infants. He kept his doctrine, and the translators kept their heads. The only problem with that is this. There is not a single record in the scriptures of an infant being baptized. Not one. And all the scriptural evidence of baptism refutes sprinkling or pouring as a method of baptism. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 25, we read about Philip being led by the Spirit, if you remember, to an Ethiopian convert to Judaism. And he's on his way home from the temple in Jerusalem. And he was reading a prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading about? He said, no, how can I understand unless somebody explains it to me? So Philip jumped up into the chariot with him and began right there preaching the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to this Ethiopian. In verses 35 and 36, Luke records this. Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture preaching Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now take a good look at what that says. What can we deduce from that? What can we observe from what's going on right here in this passage? It's abundantly clear to me, family, that Philip had shared with this Ethiopian man Baptism in conjunction with Jesus. You can't miss it. In fact, I think it's reasonable to say that you can't accurately preach Jesus without preaching baptism. And this example proves it. Now notice what the Ethiopian says there in verse 36. It says, As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, Water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, family, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? But if baptism was something that could wait a day or wait a week or wait a month because you're already saved by saying the sinner's prayer and confessing Jesus as Lord, as the denominations teach, I believe this official would have waited, The passage tells us that he was basically the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia, Candace. If baptism was something that could wait, I believe that he would have rather waited to be baptized at home in a nice, clean bathing pool rather than a river on the side of the road or a large puddle on the side of the road. We don't know what it was. But I can tell you right now, water on the side of the road in that area of the world ain't clean. And if it could wait, I promise you, this guy would have waited. Would you? No, I don't want to be baptized in a bathing pool back home in a nice clean, clean area. Let's just pull over here on the side of the road and go down into that dirty, dirty river there. I mean, let's let's apply common sense to this. If it could wait... He would have waited. He didn't. In fact, verse 36, he says, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Look at what he says there. He's like, man, what's stopping me? He's ready to go. He's ready to do it right now. He doesn't want to wait till he gets home. He's ready to jump in the water right now. And he says, what prevents me from doing that? What's stopping me? The only thing that's stopping him is anything that comes out of Philip's mouth. He's waiting for Philip to give him The green light. And so what does Philip say? 
in verse 37. He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Apparently, confession was something else that they covered in the chariot. Family, this Ethiopian is now at that point of divergence that we talked about earlier. Okay? He's there. He's at the same place that the crowd at Pentecost was. He is at this point of divergence. And what did Philip tell him to do? Did he tell him to say a prayer and ask Jesus into his heart to be his personal Lord and Savior? Did he do that? The answer is no, he didn't. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may what? You may be baptized, but by what method? Sprinkling? Pouring? Or immersion? Let's see. What does the Bible say? Verses 38 and 39, look what, look what Luke records there. He says, he ordered the chariot, that being the Ethiopian, he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. He immersed him. Because that's what the Greek word baptizo means. He immersed him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Now look carefully at what happened there. Don't miss it. Because 99% of the denominational world has missed this. They both went down into the water. The folks that adhere to sprinkling or pouring as a method of baptism have missed this. They both went down into the water. Family, if sprinkling or pouring was good enough, Philip could have cupped his hands on the bank of the river or the puddle and just poured it over his head. He probably had a helmet or a cup or something in that chariot to hold the water. He could have dipped it, poured it over his head, and been done with it. Neither one of them had to get wet if sprinkling or pouring was a method of baptism. If sprinkling or pouring was a method of immersion. When you translate it, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because sprinkling and pouring are not methods of salvation. The Bible says they both went down into the water. Philip baptized him. Family baptized means immerse. Philip immersed him. He submerged him. He buried him in the water. Now notice verse 39. When they come up out of the water. It says, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Take a look at that and what that says. You can't come up out of the water unless you went down into it. And also notice something else. When did the Ethiopian begin his rejoicing? After he had come up out of the water. Because his sins had been washed away. He had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He had been buried with Jesus. He had died with Christ in that water. As dirty and filthy as it was, it was a little dirtier and a little filthier with the sins that had been washed away. And he had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He was resurrected to a new life in the scripture reading that we had earlier. And he went on his way rejoicing. He started his rejoicing after his baptism. Family, if he had been saved by saying a prayer, which is nowhere to be found in this example or any other example of salvation in the Bible, he would have rejoiced all the way home. He would have passed by the puddle. He would have passed by the river. He would have rejoiced all the way home in that chariot. And he would have waited until he got home and unpacked and had the water brought into his nice clean bathing pool, and he would have been baptized there if he could wait. I mean, think about it. It's common sense. Just think about it. It makes sense. If he could have waited, he would have waited until he got home. 
rather than being buried, submerged in a puddle or a river on the side of the road. Family, the title of this message is A Church of the Bible Teaches What Baptism Is and What Baptism Means. And I think to this point, we've clearly established what baptism is. That baptism is that vital next step. At that point of divergence, it's not saying a prayer and asking Jesus into our heart to be our personal Lord and Savior. It's being buried with Jesus in baptism and having our sins washed away and receiving the gift of the Spirit and rising to a brand new life. Family, baptism is that point where our sins are forgiven and we receive the Spirit. Baptism is accomplished through immersion, meaning that pouring and sprinkling, those methods that are used by so many Christian denominations are both biblically inaccurate and functionally ineffective. But there's something else about baptism or immersion. There's something else that it is. Family, baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. You know, so many people in this world struggle with a guilty conscience. They struggle with things that they did years and years and years ago. They carry it around. It's, it's, it's like rocks in a bag that they haul around everywhere. They can't seem to get rid of it. And they're adding more and more rocks to their bag. They're just dragging it all over the place with them. They struggle with a guilty conscience. And they want to know what it's like to have a clear conscience. And they want to know what it's like to live in peace. And family, an essential part of receiving that clear conscience comes from being obedient to all of those absolutes of salvation that were on that slide. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 21, Peter records this. He says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now notice what Peter speaks of. He speaks of what Jesus did at the cross for us. That he was put to death, but made alive in the Spirit. Family, if you've ever wanted to know why blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the one and only unforgivable sin, there's your answer. But we're not going to go there now. It's a whole other subject. But there's your answer. If you deny the power by which Jesus was raised from the grave, which is the Holy Spirit, then there's no hope for you anyway. That's what that means. But I want you to notice also that Peter refers to the time of Noah and the ark in that passage. And how he and his family of eight persons were brought safely through the water. Family, the key to that passage is when Peter says corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Corresponding to what? Corresponding to the example of Noah and the flood. And what Peter is saying in this analogy, in this word picture, if you will, is that just as the water of the flood separated Noah and his family, saving them from the sin of the world, so also the water of baptism separates us, separates you, separates me, and saves us from our sins. Again, Peter says right there, plain as day, 
in the Scripture. You cannot miss it. Baptism now saves you. But how? How does it do that? Look at verse 21. He says, Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Family, baptism isn't a bath. Okay, it's not a bath. It's a pledge. Baptism is a pledge. It's an appeal. It's a response. More accurately, it's an answer to God for a good conscience or a clear understanding through the resurrection of Jesus. You see, without the resurrection of Jesus, family, baptism doesn't mean anything. It is just a bath. You are just getting wet. The resurrection of Jesus is what gives baptism its significance and its power. For those who want to preach that baptism in the salvation process is a work, that argument holds no water whatsoever with regard to what Peter says there. Family, the power to save is, the power to save always has been, and the power to save always will be in the resurrection of Jesus. It's not anything that we do. It's the reason why we do what we do. So family, baptism is that point where our sins are forgiven. And we receive the Holy Spirit. Baptism is through immersion, making pouring and sprinkling both inaccurate and ineffective. Baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God through the power of Jesus' resurrection. But what does it mean? What does baptism mean? According to Romans chapter 6 verse 3, Our baptism means that we have crossed over from being outside of Christ to being in Christ. It also means that we've died with Christ in our baptism. According to verse 4 of Romans chapter 6, our baptism means that we've been buried with him into death. Why? So that we can be resurrected with him to a new life. According to verse 5, our baptism means that we've been united with Jesus. In the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his resurrection. According to verse 6, family, our baptism means that our old self was crucified with Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ, Paul wrote. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. We were crucified with Jesus for the purpose of doing away with our sins and ending our slavery to sin. According to verse 7, our baptism means that we have died with Christ and we have been freed from sin. Verse 8 tells us that if we have truly died with Christ in baptism, then we can fully believe that we shall live with Him. Verse 9 tells us that since Christ has been raised from the dead, He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. Death no longer has any mastery over Him. And when we're baptized into Christ's family, it doesn't have any mastery or power over us. Verse 10 tells us That the death he died to sin, he died for the benefit of all of us. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And verse 11 tells us that because of all that Jesus has done for us, in baptism, we should consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Family, that's what baptism is. That's what baptism means. And every person in the New Testament who obeyed the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. 
Everybody that obeyed the gospel from the crowd at Pentecost to Saul's conversion to Simon the sorcerer to the Philippian jailer. Every single conversion experience in the scriptures. When you look at them, not a single one of them involved the sinner's prayer. It's not there. Family, to seal the deal and to finalize their salvation in Christ, they were instructed to be baptized, to be immersed. Because that's what baptism is. And that's what it means. And so my question for you tonight and anybody that's watching online at a later time, is that what you have done? We almost made it to the end. <laughs> Somebody's phone went off. An invitation's coming. Answer this question. If you believe that you were saved before you were baptized, do you still believe that? Or has what we've studied this evening challenged that? Were you like me when I was eight years old and you responded and, and someone said, Hey, if you want to give your life to Jesus and ask Him into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior, this person here will pray with you for that. And after that, congratulations, you're saved. You've given your life to Christ. And you can be baptized as a member of our congregation, our denomination, next quarter when we got enough people to have a big baptism celebration. Find me the passage in Scripture that shows us that. It's not there. And so if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ and confessed Him as Lord, had your sins washed away in baptism, do you need to do that now? If you're joining us online, contact us. I want to discuss this further with you. Whatever your need tonight, make the right decision. Make the decision that biblically you know is correct if you need to, together while we stand and sing.